Today, we'll take a detailed look at the ultra-high-performance microscope, SECLA, that can see the smallest object in the world. It goes beyond the nanometer level and can see an even smaller unit called a picometer. It can see things that are one billionth of a millimeter. Dr. Gathright, that is so minuscule, it's hard to imagine. It truly is. The size of an atom is several dozen picometers. That's what the microscope is capable of seeing. Sakura is located in Hyogo Prefecture, which is in West Japan. It's a rectangular 700 meter long facility, and the whole thing is one giant microscope. So this microscope that allows us to see one billionth of a millimeter is 700 meters long. It is. I know it's hard to imagine. One of its main features is that it uses an X-ray free electron laser. Why does it use a laser? To put it simply, it's to create a strong light. Our eyes see light that is reflected off of matter and use the light to discern the shape and color of the object. However, the smaller the object becomes, the less reflected light enters the eye. This makes the object appear darker. Is that why when you raise the magnification on a microscope, then it becomes darker? Exactly. So to see something as minuscule as an atom or a molecule, you'd need to shine an extremely strong light against it. Sakura's laser creates a powerful light that is stronger than sunlight by 100 million times 100 million. Wow, and how are they able to create such a powerful light? It's made of electrons. Let's take another look at the facility. Sakura is 700 meters long and made up of three main parts. First, there is the electron gun. Large quantities of electrons are emitted from here. Next is the accelerator. It accelerates the electrons to a level close to the speed of light. Last, we have the undulator, which creates a strong light from the accelerated electrons. The light is then shone onto the target subject in the experimental facility. Let's take a closer look at the mechanism behind one of the world's most powerful light sources. Entering Sakla, we found a long corridor. It's lined with cutting edge equipment. The very first piece is the electron gun. The tip is equipped with a metal compound called cerium boride, which emits large quantities of electrons when heated. Cerium boride is an extremely durable and excellent material, but it had an issue. It was unable to stably emit electrons unless it was heated to a high temperature of 1,500 degrees. A type of metal called tungsten, which is used to make light bulb filaments, was conventionally used to heat the cerium boride. The tungsten generated heat when electricity passed through it. However, a temperature of 1,500 degrees would cause it to lose its original shape. That's when Tsumoru Shintake, who was involved in the development, turned to a new material. He set his sights on graphite, a form of carbon that's commonly used to make pencil lead. Because carbon is resistant to heat, it can handle 1,500 degrees without warping. When the cerium boride is heated by the graphite, it releases enormous amounts of electrons, which will eventually become a powerful light. The next step is performed by the adjacent accelerator. It speeds up the large quantity of electrons to produce a powerful energy. Made out of copper, the accelerator stretches out over 400 meters. As the electrons pass through the tube, they are accelerated close to the speed of light. A closer look at the tube reveals thin border lines. This is because the tube is made up of numerous donut-shaped discs like this one. This is a cross-section view of the tube. The electrons pass through this middle part. Each disc is under a high voltage that alternately switches between positive and negative charges. 
When the electron enters, it's drawn to the positive charge and accelerates. As it does, the positive switches to a negative, and the electron is drawn forward once more, gaining further momentum. This process is repeated at an ultra-high speed, accelerating the electrons in rapid succession. The electrons are accelerated over the course of 400 meters, and they eventually reach 99.9999% of the speed of light, and they take on intense energy. The disks that SACLA uses to accelerate the electrons are half the thickness of conventional disks. The inner diameter of the accelerating tube is also roughly half the size. This is what makes drastic acceleration possible. With the same amount of electricity, the smaller the cubic volume, the higher the density, so it can be accelerated even quicker. Concentrating the energy in a small space made efficient acceleration a reality. However, because such a powerful energy passes through the inner pathway, even the slightest surface unevenness would disrupt the electron's movement. So they needed a processing technology for shaving metal with ultra-high precision. Until now, you only needed the precision of a few microns. But for this, we needed something that was precise right down to the micron, or even smaller on average. We were shown how an accelerator piece is shaved. Oil is sprayed as the metal is shaved with the precision of one micron. The surface of the completed piece is like a mirror. Over 13,000 discs were shaved with this level of precision and joined together to create SACLA's 400-meter-long accelerator. Wow, I'm just amazed that they are creating parts that are precise down to the micron. And I also understand that the ability to accelerate electrons to close to the speed of light over just 400 meters is also impressive. It really is. A similar facility in another country is about one kilometer long. Compared to that one, SACLA is extremely short. In fact, the C in SACLA stands for compact. I see. How is light created from the high energy electrons produced by this compact accelerator? By taking advantage of the electron's properties, electrons release light when they change directions. So all you have to do is create bends in their paths. How do you create the bends? Take a look at this. Because of its properties, a moving electron will turn when it comes under a magnetic influence. So if you enclose a moving electron between two magnets, then it'll change direction like this. So you can get an accelerated electron to turn by passing it between magnets. Right. I'm guessing that this happens in the undulator that comes after the accelerator. But as far as I could tell, the SACLA facility is completely straight. It doesn't seem like the electrons have space in which to turn. Good observation. But the undulator is equipped with a mechanism that makes it possible for the electrons to release light without making major turns. We open the door that goes beyond the accelerator. And there was the undulator, the heart of SACLA that creates the powerful light. The mechanism that creates light from high energy electrons lies within this metal duct. The duct's interior is lined with powerful magnets that can bend electrons. The magnets are lined up so that the south and north poles alternate. This causes the electrons to turn each time a north pole switches to a south pole. And they release light each time they turn. As the electrons are traveling in rapid succession, light is being discharged intermittently. 
As the electrons travel between the magnets, a strange thing begins to occur. The electrons start grouping together. And the assembled electrons begin releasing light in sync with each other. The light becomes concentrated and starts growing stronger and stronger. I can see now that by making the electrons travel in waves, they emit light without the need for large turns. But why do the electrons start bunching together? That's because the emitted light has an effect on the other electrons. When they come under the influence of the released light, certain electrons lose speed, while others speed up. They end up being clustered together. I understand. And then the electrons that are grouped together release light simultaneously, resulting in a strong light. Exactly. And there's one more point. Instead of producing visible light rays, Sakla produces X-rays with a short wavelength, which are necessary to see matter that is invisible to the naked eye. With Sakla, they succeeded in producing X-rays as short as 0.06 nanometers. This makes it possible for them to distinguish atoms and molecules. Next, we'll see how SACLA is able to produce X-rays with a short wavelength. Take a look. How are they able to produce short wavelength light? To do this, they needed to narrow the width of the magnets to oscillate the electrons at shorter intervals. However, narrowing the width would lessen the magnetic force. To maintain magnetic force, they needed to bring the upper and lower rows of magnets as close to each other as possible. Yet until now, a vacuum duct that served as a passageway for the electrons was placed between the magnet rows, making it impossible for them to be moved any closer. Then Hideo Kitamura from Riken came up with an innovative method that would make it possible for them to narrow the distance between the magnet rows. The vacuum duct that the electrons passed through got in the way. So I came up with a design that puts the magnets inside the vacuum duct. That's right. The duct shown earlier had rows of magnets inside it. He put the magnets that used to be outside the vacuum duct into the duct. But this raised a new problem. They needed to find a way to create a vacuum in the duct, which was now several times thicker than what it used to be. What's more, the metal pieces within the duct contained slight amounts of moisture. This meant that they had to heat the duct's interior and evaporate the moisture to create a vacuum state. However, heat is a mortal enemy to magnets. As a test, a magnet was attached to an iron sheet and heated. When the temperature neared 180 degrees, the magnet fell off. This shows that heat causes magnets to lose their magnetic force. So Kitamura and his team used a special processing method and developed magnets that were resistant to heat. Over 20,000 magnets were used. This is how Japan's original in-vacuum undulator came about. An X-ray laser that is the culmination of the latest technology and that is a hundred million times a hundred million times stronger than sunlight is shown onto the sample placed on the needle's tip. The ultra micro world that had remained invisible until now is finally becoming visible. Sakala is an X-ray free electron laser that produces the shortest wavelength in the world. So a combination of the latest technologies produced an X-ray laser microscope that can see the smallest unit in the world. This is the structure of a certain protein that Sakla analyzed. It shows in detail the complicated structure of a protein that's involved in photosynthesis. The molecules have been colored for categorization purposes. These blue dots are water molecules. This reveals where the protein's water molecules are located. And this is of a living microorganism. 
This is a microorganism that can be found in milk, and it's about one micron large. This image was taken by Yoshinori Nishino from Hokkaido University using Saka. This is the first time that a microorganism this small has been captured by X-ray. Is it possible to see something of this size with an electron microscope? Yes, it's possible, but you'd have to cut it thin so that the electron beam could pass through it. So you wouldn't be able to see a live one. I see. But with Sakla, you can see it in its live state. Exactly. If you look closely at the image, the red, yellow, and white areas are where the DNA is. And do you see how the yellow area looks like it's divided into two parts? Uh-huh. There's a possibility that this image captured a cell division taking place. So they were able to observe this phenomenon only because the subject was alive when this image was taken. Exactly. By raising the magnification, they expect to be able to directly observe and study the movement of proteins. When you think about it, the phenomenon of life comes down to proteins working at the atomic and molecular level. So being able to see this for real would be an incredible accomplishment. It is. Sakura could open up new scientific possibilities, which is definitely something to look forward to. Today's the leading edge is the infrared astronomical satellite, Akari. Akari's observations have been giving astronomers new and surprising views of the universe. Akari launched in 2000.